Nehemiah 1, if you know much about Nehemiah, there's the situation in Jerusalem is not a good thing, right? We got economic toil, we got structural turmoil, we got physical turmoil. And that's the state we, we find Jerusalem in this text. And what we're going to look at is a godly response to the need that's there. Now, most of you know, and I've said this plenty of times, about my, uh, my upbringing with my mom and six boys. And raised us, for the most part, by herself um, on and off working two jobs and going to school. Actually, she finished her bachelor's degree and all that, which is craziness. Uh, but when we were younger, in the house, it was really tough for my mom to keep keep everything up and fulfill all of responsibilities to provide for us. And we didn't do, you know, even though we had, you know, six boys, we didn't do a good job of cleaning the house like we should when we were younger. Just, you know, we were probably like, surprise, man, that's surprising. Uh, no, you know, we, we were actually uh, bad at that uh, most of the time. Um, and a lot of times she had to work, work really late, and she really needed an extra hand watching us. So one year my mom, she actually talks to one of my aunts in California, um, and she said, oh, you know what? She knows, talks about the struggles with these five, six rambunctious boys and stuff like that. And she's like, oh, this, there's this sweet Christian lady who could be a nanny for us and live with us for a while. And she would help keep the house clean and all that stuff and watch us while, you know, my mom would work. So this nanny actually lived with us for about a year. And although she, although she had a lot of, she really did have a lot of good attributes, she, there's some very interesting things about her to say the least. But one of the things she did was she made sure, good things, that she made sure we did our, our chores, and not just did them, but did them right. She would even take her finger across stuff. I'm like, girl, chill with that, you know. But she would do that, you know, um, and make sure we did them right. And if we deviated in any way, she would let our mom know, and our mom would, you know, cock her hand back to the 70s and give her and give us spankings and all that stuff. And I always felt like the nanny enjoyed that, you know, like what watched in the back, like I told you. And it got, maybe it was just me, you know, in my rebellious state, but I always felt like she got some type of enjoyment out of that. Well, any, anyways, while my mom was away one evening working late, um, or you were, you were maybe her second job, we, were, we would cook and stuff like that. And we, had, we were not paying attention or something. I forgot how this, I don't know if it's my fault, I don't know if it's somebody else's fault. All in all, we were cooking and cooking with grease like we often do. Uh, you know, fry it this, fry it that. And all of a sudden, like a grease fire happened on the stove. Like, and it's like, you can see a big, serious fire um, affecting things. And we're like, what in the world? And we, we go back to the back and we, uh, where my nanny, uh, the nanny was sleeping at the time. And she, uh, you know, told, there's a fire, fire, fire. And she gets up. And she walks like a zombie to the kitchen. I'm like, fire, you could, the smoke is filling the house, right? And she walks like a zombie to the kitchen. And there's a, there's a fire, right? And it wasn't until she actually looks at the fire that she became animated. And she actually goes to pour water on a grease fire, which is a bad idea, by the way. My older brother eventually had to push her, like, nicely push her out the way to pour flour on it. And it, you know, it took care of it. But my, the, the nanny's initial response to a real and dangerous need was passive at best, all right? I mean, kids are running around screaming, fire, fire, you know? The gravity of our situation in no way matched her response to our need. But sadly, we tend to respond to real needs that are important to the heart of God around us in a similar fashion. We respond to real needs in our sphere, sphere of influence passively. There are so many spiritual needs within our spiritual influence uh, and physical needs that we acknowledge and we think it's an issue but practically do nothing about them. I mean, we, we can't solve all the world's problems. We can't. We, we can't solve the world's problems in the American church and the needs of our own church even, and in the needs of this community, our own community. But you can be used of God to minister to the spiritual and physical needs that are around you and in your spiritual sphere of influence. And what I want to, want to see in this text is that we, we know that God cares deeply about human need. Especially, all need, but especially spiritual need. And we must respond rightly to the needs in our sphere of influence. 
Now, Nehemiah was not a priest, actually. I know uh, sometimes we think he's a priest or a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He was just a regular man who had a burden for God's people in God's name. He could have easily ignored the problem and stayed in his comfortable position. Instead, uh, you know, he could have easily said, oh, well, I'll let, you know, Ezra handle all that. You know, that was the other official, official spiritual leader uh, handle this. But how did Nehemiah respond to human need in, the, uh, in, this, in, in this realm of influence? What was, his pro what was the proper response? Well, Nehemiah exemplifies how we all should re we respond when we are confronted to a real need. And the first thing we see is that you should respond to need with brokenness and sympathy or empathy. Look at um, the first few verses with me here. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now happened in the months of Sizlev, in the 20th year, as I was in suits to the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men of Judah, and I asked them, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And he said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates are destroyed uh, with fire. So, <coughs> the need that, uh, what was the need that, uh, verse, excuse me, verse, the first three verses, you know, go, goes into the need that Nehemiah was responding. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, the most powerful man in the world at that time. It was a high position, actually very close to the king. And it was around maybe the end of November and the start of December, and Nehemiah's brother tells him a discouraging report about the Jewish exiles who had made it to Jerusalem. Nehemiah actually is the one to ask how the people are doing, and he did not wait for his brother to tell him. His brother said, hey, they were in the Jerusalem, they're in great trouble. They're, to, they're open to shame because the walls are broken down, the city gates are burned with fire. The walls were turned down long ago when Nebuchadnezzar turned them down, but they were never really uh, rebuilt. And when, uh, when the Jews were allowed to return. Some commentators say that Jews had tried to rebuild the wall, but were, but were stopped by some corrupt officials of the Persian king who did not want the walls to be rebuilt. This left Jerusalem, the temple that they had just rebuilt, and many people of the city vulnerable to physical attack and just open shame, right? The people were spiritually depressed and defeated on top of all that. Now, Nehemiah responds with brokenness and sadness. Though he was in Persia, this was his brethren, and they were left to open to attack. Look at verse 4. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So this was his homeland um, that was receiving reproach, right? He did not let his comfort and privilege of position make him apathetic to the real needs of people in Jerusalem. You know, people are often mad when actors, politicians, sports stars, or other successful people come up from, like, poor communities. And then when they get all this money, they don't do anything to help out the communities in which they come from. Once they get rich and uh, famous, they're like, peace. Now, sometimes people are still mad when they help, out th help them out and speak for them, but that's another story. But a lot of them, some, they, call them they call them sellouts, right? They get this money in position, and then they forget where they came from and forget their people. That was not Nehemiah at all. Even though he had a good, comfortable position, he was broken and saddened over the plight of his people. And we use that he used this privileged position and access he had to go actively help God's broken people. As soon as he heard the report, he sat down and mourned and wept. He was moved by the plight, of the, by the pair of his people. When is the last time you were moved emotionally at the plight of someone other than your own situation? When is the last time you were broken over the suffering of people in your sphere of influence? Starting with the people in, in, in your own church and the, and the needs that we have here. When is the last time other than your own situation are you, are you thinking about other people's situation and broken over their need and their plight and their trials? Have you ever sat down and thought about the spiritual ruin of your neighbors or your coworkers or people in this community? 
Are we so privileged and comfortable knowing, hey, we're saved, we got a good job, we have some of our needs met, that we don't think about the spiritual state of people around us that we rub shoulders with every day on a weekly basis. Or it could be that we're so consumed and that many of us have our own problems that we don't think about the burdens of others around us. There needs to be a healthy dose of brokenness at the spiritual plight of the community around you. You know, we have not ministered to kids in the community that we're in in a while, right? For, for a number of legitimate reasons. COVID, transportation, laborers. But because of that, I think sometimes we can forget or just not think about the plight of the people in this community, children and the adults. All right, a community that's suffering economically, really getting displaced in parts of it, it's, you know, socially, and those are important issues, but most importantly, they are trapped in a cycle of sin, which is their main, most detrimental inter, uh, uh, issue. We're not all, but many role models, and you guys talk to a lot of the kids, right, and teenagers over the years. Many role models can be rappers or remnant objectifiers and godless entertainers, gang members. You know, I've talked to teens and children over the years, and not all, but some, this, you know, this is who they want to be. If they, if they could trade their lives with this entertainer, with this godless role model, they would because they're spiritually blind. And we are planted in a community where a cycle of sin repeats itself generationally. These are real families and image bearers of God. And the, 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 the poor children that we minister to this week, that we build relationships, sometimes if you're not used to that, if we grew up with Christian influences around us, we don't think about, you know, that's why it's so important to follow up on some of these kids that make decisions because they have no spiritual support. Think about this at all. At all. The parents, school, watch whatever they want. The only type of spiritual support that they get in this community is when they come here for a lot of them. None. But we can just be so in our own situation that we don't even think about that. It never breaks us. It's customary to not have a biological dad around often, to be exposed to sexual sin at an early age for some of them. We look at kids who come to, the children, you know, come to our children's program in the past that just came to VBS, many of them smart, intelligent, full of potential, but unless God intervenes, these, in, you know, these children will fall into that same tragic cycle of sin. Sometimes it's just so reading to see some of these kids and, 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 and so thankful you know, of the interaction that you have, but sometimes you just fast forward their life 10 years and, and you can, your heart can break you know, if, if things don't change, right? And some of us have been here long enough to know kids that were younger that it has been 10 years, right? Or, and, and seeing some of the effects of sin that has happened. Church, and the worst part of it is not only will they have a hopeless, purposeless life on earth, they eventually die and go to a fiery, godless hell forever. Church, many people around us, neighbors and coworkers are on that road as well. And one of the saddest part that many people do not even realize how lost and broken their lives are. They are lost to their lostness, right? Church, the plight of the community you are called to minister to, to ever move you. Are we often apathetic, indifferent, or just in our own zone? As people who are called to minister to broken people, we should think about their suffering and turmoil they go through. Not for the purpose of just to get depressed and wild and sad and as poor little children, but knowing that we can go to a God who cares for them way more than, than we do, right? Who gave his son that, we should free, we can, uh, uh, that he could freely give them all things. That's what Nehemiah did. That's what Nehemiah does in these next verses. In the, and, and what Nehemiah does in these next verses, excuse me, excuse me is this characteristic of the meaning of his name. Nehemiah's name means Yahweh comfort or has comforted. Nehemiah runs to God in under, utter dependence when confronted with the plight of his people. We see that you should respond to need by desperately depending on God to solve the need. 
The first thing Nehemiah does, look at verses 4 to 10 before we begin here. So as soon as he uh, heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh, oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to, to, uh, to hear to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, uh, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and rules that you commanded uh, your servant Moses. Remember the word of the, that you have commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in, in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them, in, in the, bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, and whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. So the first thing that Nehemiah does when he hears the suffering of his people is to turn to God in prayer. He expresses his dependence on God through fasting and prayer. Listen. You are not, de listen, everybody listen. You are not depending on God about any issue if, that you're concerned with if you're not praying about it. You are not depending on God about any issue you are concerned with if you're not praying about it. The degree in which you express your dependence on God is prayer. Sometimes, you know, I'm just depending on the Lord. If, you're not, if that's not translating to prayer, then you're not depending on the Lord. Prayer is one of the chief ways that we express our dependence. Nehemiah knew the best thing he could do to solve the problem in Jer Jerusalem was pray to a mighty God. Ian Bounds who wrote Power Through Prayer, said this. He said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better or new, not new organizations or more or, or, or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. He also said talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to God for men is greater still. He will never talk well and with real success to men for God who has not learned well to talk to God for men. You know, oftentimes I hear this praise, you know, all you can do is pray. Said in a way as if all, you know, you just have a knife now going to a gunfight. No. When you pray, you are taking an infinite God to a pillow fight, right? Praying for, for other people in their need is not what we do when there's nothing else to do, but is the first and best thing we can do in a situation. Praying is not a passive response to suffering or need. It's the most active and helpful response you can do. Church, don't treat prayer as some cold robotic exercise that you do when you can't do anything else. You are praying to the God of heaven, all-powerful, spoke this world into existence, right? Who also infinitely loves you and wants you to run to him in prayer. Cast your care upon him because he cares for you and he cares for them. Church, when you are interceding for people at work and your family in this church, in this community, through faith, you are actively helping them in the best way possible. Because God is working on their behalf. You know, the Lord is often and still is working on me about this in this regard. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not as good. You know, when I'm, especially when I you know, start feeling bad or guilty, sometimes because of my specific season in life and everything I got going on, I wish I could do more as far as discipleship ministries and counseling and meeting with folks in the church and in the neighborhood. I wish I had uh, more ministries for our own church folks, right? I, miss, I wish I offered you know, we offer more ministries that would be a spiritual and physical blessing to this community in our church. Partner with some organization that, have, that would help us to have a broader reach and impact on people in the neighborhood. But the reality is, all those things that I wish I could do, but can't, due to help and time restraints and laborers and things of that nature, are, are not nearly as helpful as the most important thing 
I can do, and which I have time to do, and that is pray. Pray for people in this church and in the community. We don't have a huge church. If you think about our members and regular members and regular tenders, that is not going to take long to pray for everybody every day. But pray for the community. God is still teaching me that communion and intercession with him is more important than ministry activity. Nehemiah knew this truth, and, and let's really just quickly examine the prayer he brings before God. One, he, he acknowledges God's awesome character. He calls God the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Awesome God, right? The awesome, awesomeness, if that's a word, of God is the quality of God that leaves people floored when they encounter him. It is the totality of his character that spurs the response of, of fear, reverence, worship. You know, I've read through Isaiah in the past, and just a lot of times this read through Isaiah just reminded me of the awesome God we serve. Nehemiah is not praying to some idol like the, you know, the prophets of Baal were in our VBS lesson, right? Or some powerless le person. He's praying to the awesome God who at his command raises and throws down kingdoms and can move the heart of any king. It's the very same God that he says keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commands. We know that God's steadfast love is speaking of his faithful, relentless, pursuing love toward his people. Nehemiah knew that though his people were in great danger, it was nothing that his awesome, loving God could not solve. Church, do you believe that we have the same God? We have the same God. Yes, this community is engulfed in sin and negativity. Yes, our church people here, right, are often, we are overextended and we're tired. Yes, we have not perfect leadership, right? But our God is awesome and powerful and abounding in steadfast love. Let us recognize that as we run to him in prayer. No matter how dark this world gets, we still have a mighty God who's on the throne and he is attentive to our cries. Let's run to him. Nehemiah does not just stop with acknowledging God's character, but he goes on, he, he confesses sin. If you look at verse 6 through 7, I just read it early, but if you could look at that here. It says, Nehemiah calls on God to be attentive to his prayer, and the first thing he brings up is confession of sin. Now notice, like, he does not just speak in the third, he doesn't speak in the third person in respect to Israel's sin. He does not like their sin, they messed up, not me, but them, like, the, they, you know. No, as a mature leader, he identifies himself with the sin of his people and asks for forgiveness as well. He recognized his part in why Israel it was, it was why Israel was in this predicament in the first place. Now keep in mind here, we're talking about the nation of Israel here, which is not exactly the church, nor is it definitely not America or direct parallel to the community that we're called to minister. So there's not a direct parallel to the people of Israel and our church and community that we're called to minister in. But what is significant for us to apply is the fact that Nehemiah recognized the importance of confession of his sin as who is praying for the people who in reality their sin was more egregious than his. He humbled himself to realize that he was part of the problem. We know that our community and our country as a whole is alienated away from God. The corruption and ungodliness in our community and country is rampant. It has always been that way, just in a different form today. Church, if we're going to be honest, a major reason for the epidemic that we see in America, both past and present, as a whole, and in, and in our community, is a failure for the church to respond the right way or, re, or respond at all. Church, that's on us. The church has responded to the immorality and wickedness in America a lot of times with weak theology, hypocrisy, lack of love for neighbor, lesser stance on sin, watered down view of the love of God where his love is pitted against his holiness, a theology that's only concerned with coddling and telling people what they want to hear instead of seeing people as imageries that are going to hell that need salvation. Many churches have traded the systemic preaching and teaching of the word of God in context of just spewing out random verses and, you know, just trying to make people uh, feel good to please crowds. 
Some churches with so-called right theology have simply not responded to needs at all or indifferent to the sin and uh, the brokenness around them. And, or maybe, the, you know, hypocritical in addressing their own sin. They might not look down on immorality around them, but they fail to address the immorality in their own hearts on a daily basis, right? Magnifying the sins of certain types of communities and churches, but not addressing their own pride, tribalism, divisiveness, and lack of love for brethren. Church, like Nehemiah, turn to God and say, Lord, forgive me where I have failed you. Lord, forgive me for my indifference to fallen people for, that you have died for, for, the, for, uh, for my fellow church members. Lord, I am part of the problem. Nehemiah not only recognized and confessed his sin in prayer, but he repeated God's promise. He repeated God's promise. Look at verse, I'll just read this here. Look at verses 8 to 10. It says, remember the word of the Lord that you commanded your servant murder, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the ut uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Nehemiah's prayer was based on God's promise in his word. A lot of what Nehemiah actually prays here is, is, is mirrors what God said in Deuteronomy. God has promised to, God promised to return uh, you know, the people to the land of Israel after punishment and repentance. But Nehemiah trusted that that meant more than the state than what they're in now, right? Where the walls and the gates were torn down, right? And God's people and his temple were open to attack and left at a, as a laughing stock. Nehemiah models his petition in a way that we should emulate our prayers, right? That is praying God's word back to himself, not to remind him of what, of what he said, he knows, but to invoke action from God. One commentator's note said, Nehemiah challenges us to prayer based on an understanding of God's purpose and will as found in his word. He, re he also reminds us that we could always begin again in our relationship with God if we return to him in humility. So verse 10, Nehemiah almost is a re replica of Deuteronomy 9.29 where it says, For they are your people and your heritage whom you have brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. You know, as I'm praying for the people in this community and other suffering people, as I'm praying for people in our church here, I have to remind myself, you know, that the, the, the people, the faithful people in this church who many are tired and burdened and laden with trials, I have to remind myself that, God, you love this church and this community more than I do. You, you have invested your son on behalf of these people and for your glory and for your namesake act. You desire no death of the wicked. These people are made in your image. Your word says you love the whole world. God, I do what I can't do and save, revive, Lord. Send revival to your church. You want people to know the breadth and height and width of your love for them. You want them to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is your desire, Lord. Make your desire for this community and our church a reality. You care for your church. You care for their trials. You empathize with church members' pain and weakness and exhaustion. You say, cast our care upon you, for you care for us. You say, you are near to the brokenhearted. You say, come unto me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, you will give them rest. You say, you are full of steadfast love and abounding in mercy. Lord, work on their behalf. You infinitely love them. This is what you says. This is your desire. This is your people. Act, because I can't do it. And you know what? God will not go against his word, because that's, that's who he is. Pray these truths about who God is and what he said back to God. Let me just say before we move on to our last point, of, point that our brokenness and empathy that leads to prayer should start, and I, I, you know, uh, should start with people in our own church. I realize we are a small church, right? <laughs> Overextended and, and, uh, and under capacity. For most of us, I'm not asking us to extend more than what we already are. What I'm asking, even those who are in broken and tough trying times, is to think about the hurt and need of those around you, starting with your own church family. 
Are you praying for them as if it was your own situation? Many of us, due to very physical, spirit, physical and spiritual trials, have a, a lot on their plate. And there it might not be more, much that you can tangibly or physic, physically do. Although there could be, but does your brokenness over their plight cause you to go to your knees metaphorically and pray? If they're having a physical trial, relationship trial, or, or you think about people in our church, everybody here, right? Are, are dealing with, a lot of us are dealing with different things. We would be naive to think that that physical or trial that we can't control is not affecting the spiritual, our spiritual life. How broken are you over people that you're closest to in your spirit of influence? Does it bring you to your knees to pray for them? The last thing Nehemiah mentions in his prayer is a very important as it related to the needy people in our spirit of influence. And I actually include it here as my last point of the sermon here. It's, you should respond to need by lovingly surrendering yourself to act on the need. Look at verse 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cut to the king. Nehemiah asked God to give him success and favor in the sight of this man. Who is this man? <laughs> well, we know who th this man was. He was King Artaxerxes, right? The most powerful man in the world. Nehemiah in chapter 2 and in a few months after this would ask the same king who allowed the shutting down the rebuilding of the Jerusalem walls years ago if he could go back and leave his important position and rebuild his people's walls. Now the audacity of Nehemiah to ask such a thing where he could be put to death for such a request. He knew God needed to work on the heart of the king. He knew that God was the one who allowed this king to come to power, and God was the one that was powerful enough to change the king's heart at his will. Nehemiah's faith in God, coupled with God's providence in answering his prayer, is just remarkable throughout this book. But the main point you know, I'm trying to drive here is that Nehemiah is not just praying for the need. He's volunteering himself for God to use him to be part of the solution to the need. He was a cupbearer to the king. He had access to the king on the daily. Nehemiah did more than just taste the king's drinks to make sure the Kool-Aid wasn't poisoned. A cut pair in that time was one of the king's closest officials. He was his confidant, right? He had to be trustworthy. He was proficient in court etiquette. He had to be willing to, to lend a listening ear and wise counsel every time the king wanted it. He had great influence. Along with his position and benefits of living and eating among royalty, Instead of choosing to stay, excuse, excuse me, instead of choosing to stay in this comforted position, right, and eating among royalty and having the good life, Nehemiah used his position and relationship with King to be used by God and and, and volunteered to help his people. You know, requested requested uh, to be of service on the behalf of his people. In the midst of agonizing and praying. For the plight of his people, he asked God to use him as part of the solution because that was under his sphere of influence. You know, think of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he goes to God, and, or God comes to him, or I forgot how it went there, but, there, you know, he's confronted with the holy, 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 the holiness of God. And, the, and he re repents of his sin and the sins of those around him. And then as the Lord pardons him for the sin, God says, who shall go for me? And Isaiah, here am I, send me, in that text. You know, God does not just want you to pray and say, be warm and filled when you're able to be used in, of God in a situation in some way, outside of, of prayer. God wants to use the gifts and positions that God has given you to leave your comfort zone and minister to hurting people in a lost community, hurting people within your church. We need people in this church that will faithfully pray for this community in our, our church, but also say, if, there, if there's an area that we can help, hear my, send me. Even a church as small as ours, right? God has gifted you guys all with so many talents, and a lot of times I'm, I'm jealous of so many ways that you guys have are talented, right? 
We're all also in different stages of life with different responsibilities. Some of you are naturally great with people. Some of you are naturally very good listening to people and empathizing with their struggles. Some of you are very giving and servant minded. Some of you have teaching gifts. Some of you have uh, you know, teaching and speaking gifts. Some of you have music gifts. Some of you have, have more time and availability on your hands than others. And that's a gift in my book. <laughs> Most of you, I believe, have the gift of salvation and Christ in you to empower you to share your faith. Use the gifts, time, and resources that God has given you and the position that he has placed you in in this church, community, in your job, and your family to be a gospel bearer to the needy world, to be a serving member of your church. Brothers, that may look like Brothers and sisters, that may look like nursery rotation. That may look like children's ministry, right? That may look like maintenance, kitchen help, everybody helping after we clean and things of that nature. That may look like committing to, you know what, I can't do this, a lot of this, but I can commit to one visitation a month. I'm going to, with my church, collectively minister to the community. I can commit to one of those. That may look like coming to some Wednesdays as we have children and interacting and building relationships. Hey, I'm going to commit to these a month so I can, so I can, uh, so I can be an impact. That may look like texting or encouraging a fellow church member who may need encouragement, right? Seeing how you can be a blessing. Finding some way, thinking about their need and their plight and finding some way that you can be a blessing. Many of you have busy lives and trust me, I understand it, all right? But I want you to ask yourself and ask the Lord, is there any way that you can sacrifice and cut time in order to be more tangibly involved with the church in a broken community. All of us are busy, so if all of us are thinking about each other, that's going to help the whole. For some of you, you don't have any. In this season of time, you really don't have any time. You're extended to the max, right? I would ask you to pray for laborers, to pray for your church members, all right? That's an active most needed way that you can still be involved. And also, this in the season of busyness and trial is an important time that God is trying to use to teach you so you can help others in a similar situation. Byron was doing, has been doing a, uh, a good lesson on, um, you know, in Sunday school on one another, and he had mentioned we were talking about trials and how, like, one of the ways we can use our trials is a way of thinking about it as a way we can serve other people when, they, when they're in the same situation, right? So even as you're going through trial, getting what God is teaching you because other people are going to go to similar trials and God can use what you learned in your pain and your trial to help other people. So even using your trial as a way to potentially bless other people in the future. Church, we have 70 to 90 years on this earth, sometimes, some, some less, some more. Are you maximizing the time that God has given you to minister and advance his kingdom to those in need? Is everything in your schedule more important than you finding short time on earth to invest in people for eternity? Again, this is, this, I mean, this is not about being guilting somebody, right? All of us are busy. All of us have things on our heart. But I want us to do, what I want us to do is think about each other, this community, and other people and see where we can can, can get invested. What tangible way that we can help? It starts with prayer, right? And I, let me just say, it first starts with your family. If you're not discipling your family, if you're not spending time with your family, that, that's first. And then it goes to your church, and then it goes to the community. Let us all think about each other and disciple and minister to each other's needs. You say, Pastor Ben, I have a heart for this church, I have a heart for the community, but I'm not sure where I can help and where I can fit in. Please come talk to me, right? Please come talk to Pastor Wade. There's plenty of ways that we can say, hey, this is how you can help this particular member of this church. Or you can ask, this is how you can help the church as a whole. This is how you can minister to in children's ministry and things of that nature. There's plenty of things that I, we can give you. All right, just let us know. Church, let us not just go through the motions, all right? Let us not just fill a pew. Let's ask God what I can do to be used in this community and this church in a greater way? What gifts has God given you that I can use to, to be a gospel bridge to tell someone about Christ in this community? Let me just say that, thank the Lord, Christ is our example, example of a godly response to need. Now I'm here, I'm here I'm done. When Adam sinned and left the whole humanity in utter despair, all of us in this room, right, were on our way to hell. 
And instead of allowing you and me to justly go to a hopeless hell, Christ, sympathizing and empathizing with our plight, was motivated by love and volunteered to save us by offering up himself, right? He did not stand on the sidelines. He gave himself to a violent cross, which butchered for our place, right? We deserve hell because of our sin. And Jesus says, no, I'm taking that. Talk about a godly response to need. He left glory and the Father to identify with wicked people and save them. If Jesus can do that, and if we have Christ in us, then we can respond to the needs of other people.